why did you start Analysis, David? I started Analysis because I felt that I wanted to start a consultancy company. Well, I've been sponsored at university by Post Office Telecommunications. That's a really long time ago. Um, and then I worked at their Long Range Studies Division. Having done that and looked into the future 20 or 30 years, I then did a PhD here at Cambridge. And when I finished that, I'd been thinking about doing odd bits of consultancy work. I'd actually done consultancy whilst I was doing my PhD, mainly for the World Bank, but also for some other people. But I decided that I really needed to get some more experience. So I worked down in London at the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, I was, after a couple of years, I was in charge of about one third of that business, looking after telecommunications as a consulting thing. And I decided I could do it myself. Was there a so. point when you thought, this isn't going to work? Or were you worried about it not working? That's always a question for an entrepreneur. Well, there's always the concern when you start whether you're going to lose everything. And it was pretty tough because we were just starting a family. Um, uh, what I didn't realize was what I was letting myself in for uh, because running a business is actually quite a complex affair. Um, and it was within about two years or three years of that that I ended up by paying myself absolutely nothing for one year simply because we didn't have enough money. An interesting question, which is, there are, consultancies are almost ten a penny. There are lots and lots of different kinds of consultancies as well. I mean, you were going up against quite a lot of big boys, um, Accenture, Booz, they were all around at that time doing technology consulting. Um, the question is, how do you take on those big boys? That's the first question. And the second question is, how do you scale? Okay, so how do you take on the big boys? You take on the big boys by being specialists. The big boys pretended that they knew something about telecommunications. In fact, they didn't. At the time in the late 1980s, nobody was really thinking about how you could share knowledge. Well, some people were thinking about it, but nobody was really putting it into practice. So we started to actually do proper document sharing, proper sharing of experience, proper sharing of presentations, so that everything underpinning the consultancy was accumulating knowledge. So if you're up against the big boys, what you've got to do is be specialist. So we then put in place an IT strategy that supported our ability to do precisely that. I mean, analysis now, obviously it's been bought out, um, is, you know, has over 250 staff, global offices, but going from where you started, how do you build that? How do you build the know-how? How do you recruit the best staff when you don't have a brand, when you're selling from oh, nothing? That's really tricky. So when you're small, um, recruiting staff is very difficult. And actually, the, the corresponding thing is with the consultancy, when you, when you start, actually you have quite a lot of churn. Yeah. So you bring people in and then they leave. Um, well, that's the way it goes. Um, the breakthrough occurred because of that strategic relationship with the European Commission. That enabled us to develop a modeling system. That modeling system was then used in a project for the European Commission to look at telecoms investment in Europe. As a result of that, that attracted a great deal of attention building building brand then we got a new chairman in a chap called John King who used to be one of the board directors of BT his Rolodex and the fact that he joined the company gave everybody confidence and then what we saw is this growth in analysis during the 1990s it began about 91 92 we were still growing at 30% at, at a year but 91 92 we'd grown in scale remember we had the IT systems underpinning this so we could scale and then during the 1990s we basically transferred everything over to the web all the processes all the systems were then integrated and we had the brand and the presence in the market and then well through the end of the 1990s it was just making hay initially it wasn't such a high margin approach. It wasn't such a lucrative um, piece that of business initially, was it? Or yeah. was it? For the European Commission, that, that, that big modelling project about investment lost us nearly as much money as we got from the European Commission when you worked out how much it cost to do. But in, and, and I still remember going to pitch for that business, sitting in a small aeroplane, having flown from Stansted Airport, at that point was just a hut in high winds for over 40 knots and the engine and the, the airplane touching down at Brussels airport and wobbling around and the wings nearly touching the tarback as the pilot attempted to control and we had gone in gale force winds over to Brussels to try and win that contract because we knew it was the turning point for the company and we put everything into that and it paid off in spades because after that once we had accepted that we did the loss it was a dreadfully stressful time 
But once we'd done that, it was the entry point to every telecom operator in Europe. But that's, that's, is that a gut feeling? Do you know that's going to happen or you, you sense that's going to happen? An entrepreneur absolutely has to have a sense of strategy. You need to know what the next five or ten years is going to look like. Even if you can't tell it necessarily, and it's not going to happen quite in the, as a plan, but you need to have a sense of what you're doing. So as far as analysis was concerned, the sense was get these IT systems right, get these contracts in, find the ones that are going to make your name. When you get the one that is going to make your name, <laughs> risk your life in flying to Brussels to be able to get that contract and then use that to extend. You, 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 no, you have a gut feeling about what is really important. Because it, go back to the point about analysis had these web systems which we developed, we got a complete, we were a consultancy in a box so that everybody could share that knowledge. Now the, the issue then is what do you do with it? Well we looked at different things and then I had a Christmas dinner w that with, that, uh, with Jonathan Milner and that was w as a result of our respective wives working at the same art gallery and the, in that dinner after, after Christmas we met. Right, right. So, so the way the, the way the way it happened was a dialogue went roughly like this. Um, I'd not met Jonathan before, or if I had, it was only in passing. Um, so I thought, oh, who's this chap? Let's find out what he does. So I talked to him about his research, his PhD, and what he was doing now on breast cancer research. And I said, and he said that his contract was coming to an end in that July. And I said, so I said, what are you going to do? He said, well, I've got this idea for doing antibodies, selling antibodies. Um, and I you know, was thinking about doing this through the web and I thought this is a bit odd you know, I said well how do you, how, how, what are these antibodies do you mean real antibodies like I learned at school you know, all that stuff he said yes yeah. blah 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 researchers use them for identifying proteins as we all know um, so I then said well okay so how much does it cost to produce an antibody at which point he got a blank look from Jonathan because this is early days he's a researcher he's not into, into this kind of stuff so I said, well, how, how do you produce them? Well, you inoculate goats with peptides, right? OK, so how much does it cost to inoculate a goat with a peptide and then get the antibodies from it? The answer was about £1,500, right? So how many, how many units of antibody do you get? And we had a discussion about what a unit of antibody was, and it turns out that there is a standard size, an adequate, of antibody that you then district, that researchers use. And you get something like a hundred or so of, of these from the goat. Maybe if you're really lucky, you might get 300, okay? So let's say it's 300, it cost you one and a half thousand pounds. So I divided one by the other and it turned out to be about a fiver, right? So it's a fiver to, for one of these adequates. So I said, okay, well, this isn't much of a business. I mean, you're gonna need to sell a, a, mentally I was thinking this. So I said, well, how much do you pay for these? And Jonathan said 150 pounds. Now I thought, the margin between five pounds to make it and 150 pounds to sell it was good enough to get some interest. But it's also the moment when you think about there's a 20 pound note on the pavement. You know the old joke about the two economists? One says there's a 20 pound note on the pavement, the other one doesn't even look down. He says there can't be, the market would have cleared it by now, right? I thought, why is this 20 pound note lying on the pavement? So I said, but there must be a problem. You can't ship these between laboratories because there's something dangerous about them. And Jonathan said, oh no, you can put them in the post and they'll survive three or four days. And I went, holy cow, we have a business. That was the moment. Um, so Analysis had basically agreed to build the website um, for a stake in the equity, but they could ask for the cash back at any point. And that's exactly what they did at the worst possible moment. It was when, of course, the markets were in meltdown. Um, they needed the cash. I was wholly conflicted at this point. And as, as even though I was founder of the company and nominally in control, you don't exercise that control when there are conflicts of interest like that because you have to let your colleagues sort this out and make sure that you've got a distance. So I had to allow these guys to go ahead and call the cash in. And that's what they did. And that was the point at which Abcam nearly went bankrupt because it, it didn't have the resources to pay it. So I then went to my pension fund and I used my pension fund to bail out Abcam. And that's why Abcam is still around. You must have really believed in Jonathan, obviously, and his oh, vision. Yeah. I, look, I backed Jonathan all the way. Jonathan, as I said to him very early on, you know, I back people who can walk through walls. Jonathan can walk through walls. That's what I was backing.